Welcome to today's episode, my friends. We have Pastor Kelly Jane Caesar here with us, and she, oh, you'll feel me and hear me nerding out about her and her amazing impact in my world, both individually and for my family. Um, but Pastor Kelly Jane is the pastor of First Congregational Church in East Hartford, Connecticut. She is what I believe to be the future. I hope of what we will see and continue what we see now and will continue to see as inclusive leadership with regard to religion and in church settings for sure. In this episode, we talk about so many different things that I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, one first, I didn't have a deep, deep religious background, so I didn't really have the framework and understanding of how you can be curious around religion. But two, anytime I felt like I was asking questions, it wasn't necessarily encouraged and. Pastor Kelly Jane and all of the experiences I've had with her in my family's church back in Connecticut has just been so open to curiosity, to understanding the world around us through various stories, to really critically thinking about the stories we've been told and how the power of spirituality in our church and community building can really change the world for the better to be more inclusive. We talk a lot about servant leadership in this episode, whether we know we're saying it uh, specifically or we're talking about it through example. I think you'll hear a lot of examples of how that's kind of shown up. Um, Kelly Jane is just such a delight, and I am beyond excited for you to get a chance to meet her. For those of you that did grow up with any sort of religious upbringing or you are somebody that is very involved in religion right now, if you're feeling uncomfortable as we talk about these things, that's okay. That's all right. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. You can go to NikkiInnocent.com slash podcast, and there's a button on there for you to join the conversation and let us know if you have any thoughts. You can also shoot us a message on social media and let us know if you have questions. If this is something that you want to use, I know we use this in the kind of standard intro, but I want to just encourage one more time in this particular topic. If this is a, a podcast that you feel like would be helpful to open up a conversation for you and people in your life that really matter, that you felt it really challenging to be bringing up the topic of religion and how we might be able to, to kind of come together in different ways or evolve with one another in our beliefs, or maybe there's a part of yourself that you didn't feel like was welcome to show up in spaces that you're in with other people, please, please, please feel free to use this podcast episode as that invitation, as that kind of scratching of the surface to open up what will likely be the floodgates of conversation with people around you. You matter so very much. Your experience matters so very much. And as we step into what I believe is this kind of new future of how we interact with each other, it is so important for you to feel as though you belong because you do. So without further ado, here's Pastor Kelly Jane. Pastor Kelly Jane, welcome to Checkbox Other. To say I'm excited you're here feels like the biggest understatement, <laughs> but welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Yay, I'm so excited to be here. And it's my first podcast. So I'm like, ooh. <laughs> I mean, to the listeners, you're welcome for this. You're welcome <laughs> that you get to be on her first podcast journey with us. Oh, um, great. This is so fun. <laughs> oh, this is like, mm. so for all of you, you will likely have heard me already gush so much in the intro. But Pastor Kelly Jane, I will pass the microphone over to you to give up what I always say is a Cliff Notes version of your journey the twists, the turns, the aha moments that have led you to where you are today and to where you're putting all of your amazing energy out into the world? Well, it really started when I was a teenager. I was um, about 16 years old. And at that time, I was interested in dating women. And I was loved the church. So I was going to church camp. And I was super nervous because I was like, oh, my God. I think I might be gay and I'm going to church camp and like, what's that going to be like? My pastor was amazing. And she said, you don't need to worry. It's okay. Like church loves you. We love you. The church camp's going to be great. Have fun. But I was still like nervous because, you know, the wider culture says, you know, there's, I know there are other Christians out there who don't like, like gay people. So I was like really nervous to go to meet other Christians that I didn't know. So anyway, I get there and um, there's this other girl there who is like super cool and she's singing along to Rent and, um, you know, I'm just like, whoa, she's so cool. I like want to be her friend. And so anyway, we have this, um, 
what's called Lectio Divina, where you sit and you look at a piece of scripture and you let it speak to you. So I am sitting there under this beautiful tree in seminary outside of Boston and I'm reading this piece of scripture and I feel this um, strong sense of two things. You are going to be a minister. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be a minister. And you need to tell this girl, Anya, that you're gay. And I'm like, I am, can we like do that? Can no? <laughs> really? Okay, all right. <laughs> but it, it was just this really strong internal yeah. knowing that this is what I needed to do. So I get like, you know, when you're nervous and your like hands get all clammy and you're like kind of yeah. shaking inside. Like, that's how I felt. And, like, looking back, it almost seems crazy. But in the moment, I was, like, so nervous. So mm. nervous. Um, so I, like, go up to her. I'm like, Anya, I'm gay! And she's <laughs> like, okay, that's fine, whatever. Let's go get some cookies. I'm like, oh. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, it's okay. And it was. It was, like, totally fine. And, like, you know, her and I continue to be great friends. We're, like, we call each other soul sisters. We talk every week, like wonderful friendship but what happened in that moment is I felt this just embrace this love this acceptance that I was loved as I was and I that was that was it I was loved and it it connects to that call to ministry because that's why I wanted to be a minister let's just spread that love and went to college went to seminary um went went straight through and it's still why I'm, why I do what I do, why I'm a pastor. And it really is to spread God's love. And especially to those who have been told they're not loved uh, or felt like they don't, they're like not good enough. I want to tell them that you are good enough and you are loved and God loves you and you're good. And I'm going to tell you, even if, even if uh, it's not being asked of me to tell you, I'm going to make sure that you know, because the world doesn't always tell us that without some sort of prompting or some sort of extra nudge oftentimes. So I think that's so beautiful. I tried so hard to nerd out, not nerd out too loudly when you were talking about rent, because I do feel like, I mean, you and I are same age, that rent itself and the conversations and the topics that it brought to the forefront as it was kind of popular music and popular culture. And it was a topic, I mean, we didn't really talk about the gay community at all, I feel like in high school outwardly with adults. And I know, you know, we've been in a committee and a group together where we were talking about like still right now, it's a very challenging thing for teachers to know where they can and can't talk about things in a formal setting to educate about outside of the norm, you know, I use air quotes because like, what is the norm? Um, Ways of operating and loving and embracing other people around you. And if you don't have a place in your life where that's acceptable, how do you navigate, whether it's your own internal feelings or the fact that you're looking around and being like, there are people that operate different than me. Is that okay? Am I allowed to associate with the fact that that's welcome instead of a threat? And so I love so much how not only was it that wonderful intuitive knowing and that I feel like that spiritual nudge vibe that's coming through, but also how many other aspects of how we live as people are kind of swelling to the, Pastor Kelly Jane, this is what you're here to do. And look, you can do this with other people. And on the other side of those sweaty palms and that shaking is the beauty of human connection. Because I think oftentimes we're taught like, I always think about like in a, the soundtrack of a movie how when something, something that causes those stomach flutters and the sweaty hands is like this very scary music. Yeah. So of course, you're going to be afraid of what it is. Yeah, exactly. But then on the other side, it's like, oh, this is great. I should do more things that make me feel a little like that because this is what is potentially on the other side rather than that like Jaws type music on the other on the, on the front of it that I should be terrified of something that, you know, either I've never seen or I haven't experienced before. So I love I love that story. Again, this happens sometimes when people are telling their Cliff Notes versions that I like have it as a movie in my brain. Like I can see this wonderful tree that you were talking about. I'm like, yes. Um, so you shared a time, I'm assuming, where you felt other or different. I know that there are a couple others. Would you be willing to share? You can either expound there or you can share any others that you'd like of a time where you felt other or different as though you don't belong. Yeah. So I, you know, went 
as I grew up, I became a pastor and more recently I've experienced being other um, in this police clergy meeting. So the police department in East Hartford uh, has successfully uh, brought together all the clergy in town and no other group has actually done it. Uh, the police have done it. And so it's pretty much every faith community is there. So it's maybe 25, 30 people or so. So in this room, I walk in and I am almost always one of two women, sometimes three, but, and usually until the last two years, I was only the only clergy woman in, in town. Uh, I walk in and East Hartford is progressively like more, more non-whites basically. And so I'm one of probably five or six white people in the room. And there's maybe like one other clergy person that's white and the police officers are 50, 50. So it's, it's an interesting setting. Like it's different than my congregation. It's different than my denomination, the United Church of Christ. Um, and the different denominations, some, some would say I, as a woman, I shouldn't be preaching. I shouldn't be a pastor. Um, others, you know, are more, more embracive, but, um, and I'm definitely the youngest person in the room. So there's this one time they had a, like a sex trafficking person come and talk about sex trafficking and um, sexual harassment and that sort of thing. And, uh, and one of the officers who I haven't seen since, since actually made a, made a comment. And I don't even remember what the comment was, but it, I, it was not appropriate. And I got, I got that sweaty palm feeling again. And this time you know, I spoke up and I said, you know, that wasn't, wasn't appropriate. And, you know, he, you know, was uncomfortable. And I mean, he got called out and it, he mumbled something or other and, um, and you know, I don't know what happened after that. I haven't seen him again at the meeting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was just one of those moments where I was really aware of being the only woman in the room, and and hearing the comment, it made me feel like I wasn't even there. It's like wow. And I wonder too. Wow. I, I I'm feeling so many of. I, I feel the sweaty palms right now. I feel again. I'm, <laughs> Another, these scenes of these movies are great. Um, the, I think that the part when you were talking about age is a part of this too, because being younger in a room of people that have historically had authority that's never questioned, to feel comfortable enough and willing enough to even just be like opening the space up for curiosity of, is that okay? Uh, but to say that really, that's kind of great. We're here to try to rid this problem, not perpetuate it, uh, is something that I feel like we are at a turning point, I hope, <laughs> in our society where there is a huge, again, you and I are that, are that young, right? But in yeah. a lot of spaces where the power has been withheld by the older generations and has not been passed down, we still are treated as though your voice needs to be subservient and needs to be agreeable and it can't be challenging or even just questioning for clarity. Um, and so the power of your voice in that room just being like, hold on, wait a second, or out, that, you know, that wasn't all right. Uh, how that not only probably impacted him or, or you know, impacted him to see the infliction of what he just did and how that impacted other people. But I think that room probably had a different experience and a shift in the dynamic that somebody was able to and somebody that again may be the only of a lot of different groups in that room is still like hey i guess i'm gonna have to say because <laughs> this is important <laughs> for all of us yeah uh, it's such a powerful again i just think of like the the swell of how important again the music is what's happening in my brain but how important that bubbling over of like this isn't right this isn't right for me my hands shake for sure I get heat up my back and getting it out of your body because 
again, we're taught a lot of times, like shove that back down. Mm. But when it comes out, what kind of permission it gives other people, whether they know it or not in that room, whether in that group or outside their lives to be like, I know we've said this a bunch of times, but this feels wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's so much power in that. Uh, how, as you've, I mean, there's a, when you were talking it earlier about having a clergy woman be the person in your initial experience of going to church camp, how impactful do you think it was seeing women in the spaces that historically haven't had women in them? How was that formative for you, but then also being that woman so often, uh, how has that impacted your experience? That's really interesting because I grew up with a woman as a pastor and then I went to an all women's college. And so I just saw women in leadership and I didn't question it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a thing. It just was. So I wanted to be a pastor and that was encouraged. And there's no, no. Yeah. Um, so I, I went through college and then arrived at Yale Divinity School. And I walking through the hallways, all the pictures were of men. And I was so, I was just so shocked. I was so confused. And, um, you know, I was lucky. I had a professor who was with me at Smith and then he was doing like a guest professor at, at, at Divinity, at Yale Divinity that semester. And I was like, what is going on? Like, I just, I, this is crazy. Yeah. And he said, you went from being in a like supportive, like women empowering environment to quite frankly, the everyday world. Yeah. And so in some ways it was like a, a shock to the system. Um, and I learned through seminary and, and since then, like how to be the voice in the room when I need to be. Um, and trying to navigate when I need to speak up and when I don't. And because um, especially the, the police clergy room is interesting because in some ways, as a white person in the room, I have power. Yeah. And then in other ways, as a young woman, I, I don't. So it's it's a really interesting dynamic to walk. Um, yeah. Not an easy, like... It's a tightrope of sorts, yes. Yeah, it's a tightrope, yeah. uh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm so curious, because, like, one of the things that... I don't know that you know this about me and I don't know if I've spoken about this on podcast at all, but I did not grow up with much religion in my day to day. Um, it was not something that was part of me as a child, for sure. Um, my stepfather was the person that nudged us to start going to what was the Congregational Church of Town over from where you are. Um, and while I enjoyed a lot of I enjoyed a lot of it. It was through the lens of his interest and he and I had a very complex relationship. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, a very problematic figure in my life. Um, and so it was such an interesting experience of one, having kind of been born into a set of values and beliefs that weren't within the church, but obviously I'll say in America, but I would say in the world, there's no way to navigate the fact that there isn't a significant impact of religion around us. Yeah. And so, uh, I, as such a curious person, like I was always the kid that the teachers were like, of course, her hand is up. She has a question. Like always. Uh, that once I started learning more about religion and obviously witnessing the impact of a collective belief in something, uh, how there wasn't really an encouragement to ask questions or to learn things. It was like, okay, you learn this from a really young age. Like, you know how to say the prayers, you know, their call and responses. Like I would go and I would go to churches with my friends. I'd go to Catholic church. I'd go to um, Jewish synagogues. I'd go because I thought it was so fascinating to just see how people operate in the world and how the kind of, again, how people came together. I think it's yeah. really powerful. But one of the things that I have found so still makes me want to be that little kid in the front of the room asking the question is how sig are leading a podcast so. yeah <laughs> i have questions for you um is how kind of uh, patriarchal religion is and i'd say i guess my exposure to the jewish religion was a little bit more equitable gender wise but still not so much um we have many stories i mean the power of the pen i talk about a lot of times that a lot of history is written 
uh, by about at four, the male experience. Um, and so how that, along with a lot of language and a lot of just leadership, as you're talking about, really centering the male experience as we're operating as a collective group that is not just male, not just predominantly masculine, how, how do you see things shifting and changing? I mean, I feel like we were just in a service a couple of weeks ago where you were really kind of challenging the idea that it was only men whose voices were heard in the past. Maybe it was how it was captured. Um, but how have you kind of navigated the reality of knowing the power of the women that you were surrounded by from, you know, when you were younger through schooling and then stepping into quote unquote, the real world, but also knowing that the real world is evolving to be more gender inclusive for sure. So how, how has that kind of shown itself as you're using, you know, a lot of information that has tended to either erase or minimize the non-masculine perspective. Yeah, I find myself teaching a lot that, um, you know, part of my training was in feminist theology, womanist theology. And so bringing that into the congregation, even though it's like at least 60 years old or something, and you know, there's more recent stuff too, but, um, that there's a lot of, you know, everyday people who aren't familiar with some like major feminist theology. Um, so I find myself teaching uh, a lot and, yeah. and just my presence makes a big difference. Um, you know, inside the congregation, people see me preach every Sunday. So they're used to, you know, they're like, oh yeah, she's our pastor. Uh, even inside the United Church of Christ, there's actually more female pastors than male pastors um we are a very progressive denomination so oh, that yeah. you know part of it yeah. um but in the outside world you know if i say i go to a meeting with my moderator who's an older man they almost always will think that he's the pastor so uh, yeah i run into more patriarchy outside of my immediate context than within it which is kind of a interesting dynamic yeah yeah but yeah I do a lot of teaching and and a lot of just being me in the space which it is <laughs> I mean, yeah, right it's the power of representation right there yeah I feel like I've also witnessed your storytelling mm. and your ability to bring these stories of old whatever that means, because I don't know always, but, you know, it, when, the, when the, in the ages all of these happened and tying them to very present stories that are the same. And so understanding that in reality, there's no way that the world is only being seen through one particular demographics office. Yeah. Even though right now we're still in a very white, masculine, heteronormative society, we're seeing more and more every day that like, it's impossible for us to actually continue this whole civilization thing if we don't include other people. Um, so I think that you do such a wonderfully powerful way of bringing people along by not being like, you're doing this wrong, do this right. It really is that I think of, again, going back to, going back to under that tree of the power of kind of seeing and witnessing a story outside yourself, which, you know, rent gives you the opportunity to be like, okay, I'm grappling with how does this make me feel that I'm watching another person's story? So that's helpful. And then also I'm welcoming conversation. I'm not saying I am the only in one authority and there is no opportunity to question or have conversation. You do such a good job in the storytelling of welcoming curiosity and conversation and alternatives. And even saying like, here's the places that I look this stuff up take what's helpful for you. <laughs> and and yeah. I'd love to hear what you have to say. I think there is much more of a call, a conversation that you tend to create than what I've, again, witnessed as the researcher more than the, the, <laughs> um, the expert in any kind of way of just, you know, how you create space for religion to be something that is inclusive. And I think that that's so incredibly powerful. Religion in itself is such a powerful mechanism for our society and so to be very intentional about it is so wonderful I think it's part of being a woman in ministry too like if I were to be more like this is the way it is it wouldn't be received well no. um, I don't even know if I would get away with it like <laughs> <laughs> but also it's not the way I want to lead and I 
you know, I think that's part of, you know, for me, feminism is, is a more inclusive, like I always picture a circle, like, yeah. and I think that's where the church is actually going, like where the church is most healthy and thriving are places where it is more interactive, it is more of a circle, it's more uh, people, each person sharing their wisdom. Yeah. And, you know, as a pastor, I think part of my job is teaching, part of it is story, you know, and teaching in the sharing sense and yeah. asking questions uh, and getting people to think, like, go a little deeper. Um, it was very tempting. Someone will come to me and say, you know, why, why did this bad thing happen? Or what do I do about X, Y, and Z? And, you know, it's tempting for me to be like, oh, well, this is what you do, or this is what I believe. <laughs> yeah. But it, what does that do for the person? Right. like they need to find their truth and so it's i find it's far more enriching if i can ask them the questions maybe give them some resources and and sit with them in the uncertainty yeah um, and you know i look at our scriptures they're they're not you know some some traditions try to make it really direct but i mean the bible disagrees with itself so i don't know how you can <laughs> i mean people do it and it's like some creative writing and i have i'm like that is kind of cool that you somehow made those four very different stories like come together like i'll give you credit there and mean the one thing that you were hoping for them to mean whether they were saying it or not yeah 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 like wow that's like really you know bravo um but then there's i think there's also power in saying like there could just be four different stories and they could all be true and they could all be good and we can just let them all be next to each other yeah and we don't have to force them to try to be one, yeah. one truth. There are just four truths. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. It's okay for there to be multiple things that are true and exist at the same time. Yes. And you're allowed to decide what works for you and not think that the other person doesn't deserve to be here. I think there is, again, this is, I, I will be on a women's leadership soapbox all day with my <laughs> all day. I think there is a part of this that is really what we're watching in which I think is funny in a lot of ways is a lot of the reasons that we're able to be more collective and we're able to see um, that we are not alone in a lot of experiences where we have felt other separate, alone, different, the outcasts, the whatever kind of language you want to use is a lot of male-led companies that are creating opportunities for us to come in circle with one another. And what's happening even, so this week we had one very wealthy, powerful man buying Twitter. How that then is like, we have this, dispersed space for people to be talking about different things and again algorithms thoughts disinformation yes all of that is true and then what we're watching is the kind of power grab dynamic of yes all these things are here but let me be the gatekeeper too and so how we grapple with this idea of there are so many of us and our voices deserve to be heard but also the kind of historical like but i need to be the king here i need to be mm. the leader i need to be the voice that you listen and look to in times of uncertainty. I think a lot of times people, I, I'm going back to the part where you were like, when people come to me and say, what do I think? Like, of course I have a thought, but it's not about my thought. It's about how can I be supportive and helpful and create the space for you to trust your thought. Um, and we're not taught that oftentimes. We're taught to look around for everyone around us, especially again, a lot of the people that I coach, a lot of women, especially millennial women, we've been told that we're like lazy and entitled and that there is this kind of like youth and immaturity. And also we're heading into our forties, we're in our forties, we're leading, we're doing all these things, but those messages are still there that have us doubting the viability of who we are. And even in last week's uh, sermon, you were talking about how important it was to own and understand your own personal power. And I'd love to just hear how, cause I think that holding the space for that wobble of am I powerful? Is it okay for what I say? Um, how that has, I mean, I'm sure in your own individual journey, as you're talking about, like, I learned how to step up and use my voice. How has that shown itself um, through people within that kind of uh, closer circle that are like, yeah, this is Pastor Kelly Jane, of course, or the kind of the outer yeah, range of people yeah. that are like, this is different. Um, how has that kind of encouraging to trust your personal power and your personal nuanced operating procedure that you need yeah well I, you know 
I've in the last few years as a pastor, I think I've grown to recognize those spaces where like I do claim my authority and I do speak. So, and, and a lot of that is in my sermons. So, yes. and I have a platform every Sunday where, you know, hundred or so people listen to what I have to say. So that's, you know, like use that, right? Speak that. But then there's other places where I'm learning it's better for me to sit back. And so, you know, when George Floyd, Floyd was murdered, one of my congregants, you know, called me up and she was, or she, she made a prayer request. And I think I called her and, and we were talking and she was, she was really upset about it. And so I'm listening and I'm listening and she's like, what do we do? And I want to do something. And, and it was, there was a moment in that conversation where I felt this temptation to, to be the gatekeeper, to, to own it, to be like, okay, we're going to do this thing and let's go and, and like really take the lead. Yeah. And something had shifted and I, and I didn't, I actually stepped back and I listened and I, and I said, you know, it sounds like you want to get some people together and let's do that. And so what ended up happening is I did some, you know, some back leading, some back work in terms of invitations and, you know, using my place in the pulpit to encourage people to attend. But when it came to the meetings, I wasn't the one leading it. Yeah. And, and what emerged is this racial justice ministry in the church that has been incredibly powerful. Um, I mean, there's been stuff the group has done outside of the congregation in terms of, you know, diversity books and, and supporting businesses and that sort of thing. But what I've seen as a pastor is the people in the group, how they have really learned so much over the last couple of years, deepening their understanding of um, systemic racism and asking like deeper questions and and the thing that i've learned as a pastor is i went to the meetings i didn't leave the meetings i didn't get the speakers i listened and i mean you've been in a lot of them so you know that when the opportunity presents itself i'll ask the question that needs to be asked or share the story that i think will help flesh out the conversation in a different way and um you're amazing at it by the way <laughs> thanks yeah my sister and I talk about it a lot <laughs> <laughs> that uh that I feel like that it's another tightrope right of mm. okay where do I step in because I know I know the power of my voice in this space and I know my my relationship with this group of people I'm not necessarily if I step into leadership everyone's gonna oh yeah okay great but this person felt this passion and this person knew that there were other people that needed a space to talk about this. And I have found it, we, before we started recording, I have found it one, so individually rewarding because I get to go with my father and my sister. And so having conversations that in our household, I think have been needed to be had for a long time, but didn't have the encouragement um, or even just the initial opening that this is safe and okay to touch this topic. Uh, but I also think that the, I had actually a, um, a member of the ministry reach out to me this past weekend asking for one of the resources that we had talked about a few months back being like, you know, I actually had this experience and I don't remember exactly what it is, but I'd love to be able to use the tools we talked about. Do you mind telling me? And to me, that is, it, 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 I keep thinking of like an educator or teacher that's like, <laughs> Great, I taught you it. You remembered it on the, again, does anybody use flashcards anymore? I don't know, but you remember the short term memory for the test. Great, but like, are you using it in practice? And to witness that and have it be, it's not just in the confines of those weekly Zooms or those set up event or monthly Zooms and those set up events that we're doing. It's, this is something I'm trying to practice every day. And it's something that I'm still going to have that, like, <laughs> that sweaty palm sick to my stomach feeling when I have to do, because I, you know, it's me stretching every time I have the opportunity to do it. Uh, but creating that space and creating it in a way that's the community-led dynamic, I think was, as somebody that is a nerds out about leadership, I feel like it was such a beautiful gift and also is what, I guess, servant leadership is all about. But I, I believe what is 
what modern leadership, women's leadership, inclusive leadership is all about understanding that it is so important for other people's stories and voices and contributions. And that person being able to see themselves as a leader in something that they were passionate about, I think is incredibly powerful. It really has been. And, um, and she's been a leader before in different things. Um, so yeah, but yeah, but, but the way she and, and she had a co-chair and just watching the congregation decide how they were going to address racial justice. Yeah. And they did it in a way that was different. Like beforehand, I had been trying to do book studies and pre and like <laughs> protests and rallies and whatever. Like they, you know, they were polite. But um, with this group, they invite people that they know or they know of know of. So there's a more, um, it's a more personal dynamic. So it's people sharing stories with one another, and it's so authentic and and powerful um, yeah. and it's something like wow if I had tried to do that on my own like it wouldn't have happened and it, what happened was something just incredible yeah and it can evolve I mean the whole yeah. idea of crowdsourcing right like the, the, a word we now use in our collective society <laughs> but the fact that we have the ability to do powerful things together rather than having one person lead us and us all follow yeah I think it, it's just a different kind of paradigm of how we can operate in the world and make change happen um, well, at the same time, I get, I get nerdy about data sometimes that like the actual numbers don't support us continuing in the model we have that have the only specific demographics leading. And so stepping into spaces where it is more of a, oh, we're doing this together and my voice matters just as much as that person's. And it doesn't mean it cancels theirs out or they cancel mine out that we can disagree. We can ask questions. We can't hang up and be frustrated and then can't show up the next month and be like, okay, I can come back here. It's okay for me to have had feelings about this yeah. um, is, is a really, really, really powerful thing. Um, they know each other. I think that's a big part of it. Like they have relationships outside of that group yeah. that if that particular night is hard, we're going to see each other on Sunday. So yeah. you're going to come back. There's a safety there to, to go deeper than I think you would at like, a, a random workshop right. in some <laughs> far away. Yeah, you know? or in the workplace. I think a lot of times you're jockeying for a specific level of position in, in certain environments and to be able to come together as a congregation and a community that it isn't about, okay, again, let's not act like there aren't political dynamics and, and relationships that we're, we're always trying to navigate. You know, right. we're show, I'm showing up, it's my father and my sister. So yeah, there's different ways that I'm showing up in that space that if they weren't there, I might not. Um, yeah. But at the same time, the fact that I think also one of the pieces that is so powerful about this group is that it's not just bringing speakers in, it's asking people within the group to use their voice, either it is to share a story about someone else, it doesn't have to be them as the expert, mm -hmm. but having their voices heard in this space about this topic gives that kind of, when you were talking about the power of the pause and, and noticing, okay, am I, am I meant to be talking right now or am I meant to be listening? Am I meant to be asking a question or am I just holding the space? That in practice, this particular group has created that in, again, the organic, organic nature of here are the topics we wanna to talk about, how do we wanna talk about them? Um, which again, I think is so powerful. I will say powerful to be somebody in a room that gets to witness it and participate in it for sure. The next question that I have in my mind is you, you kind of talking about not only being a younger generation in this space, but kind of bringing a new generation into this, this world yeah. and this space right now, how, as you've been stepping into motherhood, how has a lot of these learnings and the shifting of, I mean, the foundation underneath us is moving and shifting and changing, right? <laughs> How has your, I guess, background and experiences helped inform, but also what kind of things do you feel like you have learned based on really being willing to step into the unknown and the in-between so often? Yeah, becoming a mother has, wow. <laughs> like, it's, it's a whole new challenge. Like how, so how to be a, a pastor and a mother and I'm also a wife and, and then have time for me, like so many um, 
And it's changed, it's shifted how I think about myself as a pastor. Um, you know, there's talk about patriarchal modeling. There's a, this idea that um, actually after all like the abuse scandals, there's this movement to have huge, um, to have a lot of boundary trainings. And it was, okay, so you can't have, have friends in the congregation, like very separate, like clergy over here, congregation over here. And there's like a reason for that. That's a good reason. But what I'm finding as a mother is that, wow, I have this ex incredibly spiritual experience that's totally transforming how I think about God and the spiritual life. And like, I kind of, I have to share part of that. Like, I can't, it, it doesn't sit over here by itself. Like it's a part of how I do ministry. And um, so my sermons, you know, I share some of that from time to time. And what I found is people coming forward and being like, oh, me too, or it hits in a different way. And when I'm in like pastoral care situations, it's different. It's, you know, I, I come to those interactions with, you know, oh, this person's also a mother or this person's also a child and, uh, or maybe an adult child, but you know, yeah, yeah. it's different. And um, yeah, I'm still like figuring out how it all goes together. And I think, you know, a lot of working mothers are. Um, yeah. The ministry's always been my calling and can't imagine not being a pastor so yeah. it's just like how does how does being a mother impact being a pastor and right and you witness the power of stepping into that I mean one of the things yeah. it's funny as you're talking about because it was much bigger than Boston but that's where I was when I learned about like well I guess I was in Connecticut when I learned about it top level but I remember when the movie Spotlight came out and how much the Boston Globe's whole thing was going into just the dynamics of how like there's a lot of things that are happening that we think shouldn't be happening but we don't really know as a collective how to handle it and so what we do is we like to punitively punish and we kind of hold accountability but we don't and we subvert like there's all these different dynamics and so oftentimes when we're uncomfortable about something, we either separate or act like it didn't happen or just like try to destroy and make it go away. Yeah. And unfortunately, when we don't handle things like the human beings that are involved, the multifaceted human beings that are involved, we then ask ourselves to rectify a situation without our humanity in a lot of ways. And so yeah. showing up as part of yourself in order to do work that is so incredibly whole human oriented is really, I can only imagine really discombobulating. Much different, much, I don't know, smaller stakes, but like I remember when I was first learning about women's leadership work and coaching. And again, I grew up, my father is a soccer coach, like I grew up around people that were the label of coach. And I've been in therapy for since I was in my single digits. And so the understanding of creating and holding spaces to help people move towards a goal, not foreign for me. However, being the person that has that title and being told that I couldn't actually have human connection with them in order to uphold whatever level of hierarchy there was. And so it was like, you can't be friends with your coaching clients and you can't, you can't share too much about yourself, which again, I think is a lot of that therapy model of like, this isn't about you. They shouldn't mm -hmm. should only know of you as, as a therapist, not as a whole person, how that creates actually the problem that we're trying to avoid when you have to separate parts of your humanity from showing up in the world and how then you have to juggle and I guess negotiate away parts of yourself to be able to show up appropriately in places where there are kind of rigid rules that are like you can't <laughs> people can't know about your life you're like but my life is what informs how great I can do my job what are you talking about <laughs> yeah yeah it's like yeah you nailed it it's so true. It's so, so true. challenging for sure. Yeah. I, oh, one of the things, and let me say this, I feel like one of the, there have been so many moments and times where I've had the opportunity to be in your presence, whether it be virtually or in person, where your ability to weave your story into things without it being the prominent point or the <gasps> moment or anything, like you're not necessarily the where the spotlight's being shown, but it helps further the message. 
is yeah. incredibly powerful. And I remember the first time you talked about um, being bisexual in church. And it was something that it was so normal. It was so part of the conversation. And I was just like, this is the coolest experience I've ever had. Because again, I feel like in movies and TV, it's always this <gasps> moment. And you were just like, yeah, this is my life. And this is how I do things. And this is, and I was like, this is okay. This is what church could be. Because I, again, <laughs> I grew up with the idea that church was something that in, a, in, in a certain ways was that you had to hide parts of yourself and you couldn't bring that to the party, but also that we couldn't be different. And so being different and not being some huge thing, being different and welcoming all different people into the space, I think is so powerful. And the thing that every, literally every service that I'm at, how you open service is one of those things that I believe has created the welcoming of just normalizing differences at the outside world, outside of those four walls or those four <laughs> sides of the Zoom. Uh, it just makes it a normal way that we bring ourselves together. So do you mind talking a little bit about kind of how you open service or you open spaces? I would say <laughs> service, but like even in the, even in the ministry dynamic, sometimes this happens. Uh, how, how you have chosen to approach that. I don't know if this is kind of a collective thing everybody does, but I found it to be so incredibly powerful um, in welcoming people to bring parts of themselves without it being some big Hollywood moment. Yeah, so it's, um, I use the tag. You are welcome here. So that's like a national United Church of Christ deal. Uh -huh. um, and I elaborate on it because I've found in my own experience, if you don't name, name the things, then those who have been excluded assume that they are still excluded. So if you don't say, you know, you're welcome regardless of your sexual orientation, or not, not even regardless, I don't really like that word, but you're welcome, you know, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, you know, you're welcome here people who are any one of those who have been told they don't belong, hearing them specifically named says, oh, okay, this, like, this is for real. Yeah. Uh, this isn't just like sugary, like chit chat, <laughs> fun language. This is like, oh yeah, like I'm really welcome. And um, I like, I'll, I'll ch I obviously change it every Sunday, but I'll, I'll usually pick, um, certain things based on what the rest of the service is about. Um, so, you know, you're welcome here if you have lots of questions or if you feel really grounded in your faith, uh, you're welcome here. Um, little ones and older ones, especially if a little kid cries out, that's like perfect timing, like, you know. Yes. Um, and it's amazing the impact it has had. Um, you know, being in this kind of inclusive church setting, I sometimes forget the power of it until, you know, a visitor comes and kind of like you're explaining, they're like, whoa, wait, what? And oh. <laughs> yeah, they're just blown away. And it's incredible. I mean, just the new members we had recently, each one of them talked about how they had been excluded elsewhere and they found a home at First Church and in East Hartford and and that welcome how much it meant to them yeah totally transformed their lives yeah so, yeah this is why I went into ministry yeah well and it's funny right because I'm, I'm covered in chills right now my body temperature tends to tell me tell me even more wisdom how I'm feeling than my mind does oh yeah uh, it's funny how something that seemingly so because I'm like oh yeah you do this every week right and I'm like it, it's funny because you're like, I changed every week and my mind goes, oh yeah, she does. But I know it's, it's space setting. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, just, just in case, whether you've been here or not, this is the, we just, this is our kind of common agreement of how we hold this space mm -hmm. and how seemingly simple it feels as somebody that's in the space of, of course, these are our kind of community agreements, but it to be something that is so like explosively powerful to shake up all the barriers that have been in the way of you being able to step into your faith and to be able to step into spirituality with other people is like, I hope, I don't know. I just, I, 
so much of what I do believes that it's those things that can feel so small to you when you're in a position where it's not where you've been marginalized or poor, your humanity has been degraded, de degraded, that you can kind of step in and say, oh yeah, I can hold this space. Again, this is how I use my power and my privilege to actually say that like, come on, <laughs> you can come here too. We can all be together. And uh, it's, it's the little moments that I think oftentimes especially because the little moments are things that we've gotten kind of taken away from us a lot in the last couple of years that we haven't had the opportunity for those little like, hey, good to see you. Or oh, we bumped into each other. It's like, those aren't the things that we're as used to, but those are the things that actually create the fabric of how we operate as a collective group together and how you find where you belong as who you are, not the costume or the mask you need to put on in order to be like, yeah, yeah, okay, you're allowed admittance now. Yeah, it's so yeah. true. So, okay, I, because I, I, one of the questions that is like, first of all, I have so many questions that come up during service. And so I will um, we'll have to it. do that all the time. Um, but one of the things I'm so curious for your take on is how you see the future of religion, worship, especially as you're talking about coming together with all different people, with all different beliefs and backgrounds. And we're, again, in a society where we're not as separate, even though, again, the media will tell us how much we hate each other and how divided we are. Like, in reality, we're actually coming together in a lot more spaces. We're seeing people that are different than we are. And how do you see as, <laughs> I'm like the young kid in the room, even though, yeah, uh, you're, I mean, to me, you are the present and the future. And you are witnessing the evolution of what we're having to deal with in the pressure cooker of the last few years, for sure. How do you see this future or, or how, yeah, how, one, how do you see the future, but you know, what is your kind of your ideal future that we're working towards? Yeah. I, you know, it's twofold. Some people will say the church needs to totally change to be relevant and others will say, no, we need to stay. We've got a good thing going. Let's keep it. And the truth of the matter is we need both. There's people who are going to want more of that black and white theology. That's where they are in their life right now. And they need that. That's so like, there are churches that are going to do that. And there are people that are going to need that for, I don't know how long. So that's going to be there. Where I actually find more energy personally, and where I think the church is going to flourish is in those places where there is more interaction going on. So, you know, a kind of a neat thing happened um, with COVID and, and Zoom is you could see everyone equally. You weren't looking at the back of their heads. And yeah. so when we, you know, we were on Zoom for a good year exclusively um, and, and people saw one another. And, you know, we did something at First Church. We, we didn't live stream the whole service. And so people came on with their videos on and they talk to each other and they like, you kind of did get some of those like elbow bump, like, Oh, there's your cat. Like there was a <laughs> sense of conversation that mm -hmm. happened. Uh, that was really powerful. And I think those sort of interactive experiences is where the church and where faith is going. And it's where I think millennials like myself tend to gravitate towards. Um, we aren't looking for someone high above us to tell us what to do. Like there's wisdom within us. So can we gather around and share that wisdom? And so, you know, there's you know, fun things popping up like dinner church, you know, have dinner and you do church around the dinner table. And like, oh, cool. Um, so that's, that's a popular thing that's happening across the country world. And it's like goes way back to the beginning of the church. So it's not like a new idea, but <laughs> it's um it's making a comeback, I guess. Yeah. And and then there's stuff like instead of people sitting in pews and looking straight ahead, you have you take the pews out, you're sitting in a circle, or you um have stations around a sacred space and people move to different places. Like that's another oh. popular thing. And so I've done like some of those things with my congregation in East Hartford. And it's interesting, those sorts of events tend to draw people who are outside of the congregation as well as those within, but it's, um, 
I, I found that interesting. And it's, I think that's where churches are, are going to head and, and not every church will go there, but um, I think that's where a lot of faith and faith sharing and spiritual growth is going to happen is in those more interactive, circular, non-hierarchical type settings. And yeah. I love it so much. I, so this will not be new news to you. <laughs> um, one of the pieces of I, feminist wisdom that I love so much and I actually use in a lot of the practices in which I hold space for people that are doing work is, is Gloria Steinem talks a lot about this in one of her books about um, talking circles and not and all of them are called talking circles, but huh. when in matriarchal kind of civilizations in um, we'll say communities, a lot of times the way that people gather is in circular ways. It's also a history of the civil rights movement. A lot of uh, the gatherings were in, again, that kind of equitable dynamic, like everybody's voice, everybody has the same mm -hmm. real estate in Zoom, like that whole space, but also coming together and seeing that you are a part of a whole that matters um, and how powerful it is to witness the presence of and see again, I think the humanity in the face, the facial expressions, the just, you know, not the back of the head. When you just said that, it hit through my whole body. Um, but the other part that it, uh, that came up for me as you're talking about kind of the, I'll say non traditional, even though again, you're like, this is probably the most traditional that we're coming together over food and talking about this, but whatever, uh, is I don't know if you've ever saw the movie Sister Act. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite movies when I was growing up. I know all the words and all the songs. Um, but I remember in that movie being like music was obviously a huge powerful component to it, but it was the opportunity to infuse the reality of today and the things that you're interested in and being interactive with not only one another and the music and doing it a little different, but also the community and bringing mm -hmm. church from outside just the walls of where church was out into the world. And I feel like you do such a good job of that too, of just like, let's go out, even this past week, go outside and like be part of the world outside of this experience of how we do things every single time. And the willingness, I think, to open doors, both literally, but also I think alternative options for how to find people that are looking for meaning and looking for connection with each other is so powerful. Again, especially where we are in our society right now, we're all, I mean, we hear about this through work of like the great resignation and people trying to figure out what they want to do and change their lives around and all these different pretty seismic changes that are happening for individuals as well. People are looking for, okay, where is a place where I can more deeply understand my place in this world, how I can be around other people that are willing to have conversations with me. And I, I mean, that's kind of the church. <laughs> it is like, kind of the church. Right, right. But making it more accessible because I do feel like what you're talking about, about being where people are, offering what people are looking for, welcoming people in a way that's like very much like, yes, you, exactly, you, 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 I mean, you come here, is, is the answer for so many things, but I do feel like it is something that in a culture of connection, but really like social media connection where somebody has to actually invite and connect with you. And like, so it's this idea, yeah, we're all available, but we're so used to having some sort of prompt or welcome or nudge to do that, that by offering different ways to connect with that part of yourself, you really are welcoming people into what is a fabric of a family that does a whole bunch of different things. There isn't yeah. just one right way to do it. Yeah, there's so many different ways. And I mean, I think that's the beauty of of church communities is, or I can't speak for every church community, but <laughs> for, for at least my congregation, you have really different people coming together. And you know, we have like Democrats and Republicans, we have young and old, different races, you know, people who just immigrated to the country and people who have been here since like, I don't know how long. Um, and so you have these different ideas, but it's a place where you practice being together. Um, we'll, back to the racial justice group. So sometimes there's tension, like there's, oh, there's gonna be tension when you get different people together. But the, a miracle that I find is that they stick together. They say there's something bigger and more important. And, yeah. you know, sometimes our society can get so individualistic and like, everyone's fighting to like have the coolest picture on Facebook or whatever. And it's, yeah. 
<laughs> and like you can't be part of a church community and do that there's like a humility that gets you have to have and so it you know there's a commitment there that's a little different than our culture has right now where it's like oh i just want this one thing let me go get my spirituality in a box like yes you, you can't do that you can't like get your spirituality there's an easy button to this right yeah yeah, yeah. like no you, it's just it's something you have to work at you have to stick with and there's you you can't do it alone no. uh, you know there's a there's this false narrative that your spirituality is a private matter that you, you know just personal for you and that just breeds egotistical like you get you decide whatever you want yeah. but when you have to do that with other people you start to find like I find like what I think might be right I talk to someone else and like oh maybe huh you yeah. have to rethink that true and we teach each other yeah and that's like that's how people grow in their faith is rubbing up against others and sharing and learning and sometimes you teach sometimes you learn and you're probably doing both at the same time and that's I think that's the importance of doing faith in a community yeah and having permission to evolve I think too because again yeah. we're talking about that like quick hit I'm going to get, it's like, it's on demand. How do I, you know, how do I get it done? How do I check it off my list? How do I make it transactional instead of the transformative, powerful thing it, it has the potential to be? Yeah. And how we create, we don't have very many. I see, again, I'll tell you my vision and why I decided to like change my whole life around towards like, how do we create spaces where we can be more human with each other is that yeah. we have become so thirsty for, it's like, when you're super, super thirsty and all you're drinking is soda that just makes you more thirsty, but you think you're drinking, like that's kind of what the individualism for sure, that's kind of what the social networking that really is about performative, <laughs> like, like, you know, how can I beat an algorithm rather than how can I connect people? How powerful it is to really witness spaces that are held for a longer period of time that allow you to change your mind. Because I do think that we are and if we think about the leadership in our country, for sure, and then, you know, because we are American, oftentimes our leadership is influencing the rest of the world, oh, capitalism, um, that if we're not even allowing the people that are leading us to have differing opinion over time, like when we think about like our presidential debates or even just any kind of political conversations, like, well, you know, in 1975, you said this, and the idea is that you could not never have evolved or there was more nuance than the clip. Like the, the fact that we base it on this kind of fixed dynamic to be in a space where you're watching somebody grow over time by their relationship with you and relationships with other people in that space. Again, as we were talking about before, just witnessing. I don't need to tell you because if I tell you oftentimes you're gonna feel some sort of projection on like what you're doing that's wrong and you're gonna shut down. No, 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 let's just show you the power of that evolution. Let's show you the power of your influence on other people. Let's show you what you can do together. And hopefully that's the education. We don't need one person in the front of the room telling you how to live your life. And so you just go and do it like the robotic version of yourself should, that you can- so scary. It, it <laughs> Why? I, oh, I, yeah, there was, um, I just saw this on some social media. I'm like, it keeps us separate, but it also teaches me a lot. There was this whole thing I, I was reading about our education system in America that's based on, it's I think it's a Russian and German blend of education that was around um, uh, subservience is not the word of just uh, getting people in line. I can't think Ooh. of the word. It's sort of the name. Um, yeah, it was getting people to lock in step. So I think about it like a machine getting your where you're where you're supposed to be to make things move. And it was very much about um, keeping people in line, keeping people disciplined. And that is where a lot of our traditional education systems have branched off from, which makes a lot of sense. We're all sitting like you're talking about backs of yeah. heads, you're looking at one person, all that kind of stuff and how we're now in a space because we were just talking in, the, in one of the racial justice ministries about critical race theory about how powerful it is for us to one, see each other and two, have different voices in the room and the abil ability to really understand that there are different perspectives and you don't have to say yes to all of them. You're actually, you're capable of, of nuanced thought and it's actually pretty cool for critical thinking to be part of the party. 
Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think there is, again, so much power in the future you're talking about that it's happening in places of worship, but it's happening in so many other places as well. And I use the word contagious a lot when I'm talking about when you're making change, which feels awkward in the time of COVID, but <laughs> it is one of those things that you find one place where you're able to ask questions and evolve and learn and grow from people that don't look like you, act like you have the same experience as you, whatever, that then you're going to inherently bring that into other spaces. Like when you become a mother and you've learned so, like you can't just shut off the fact that that's part of your experience to just be appropriate in another space. And so how powerful it is to hold space and welcome that rather than, and name it, I think you, again, name it as this is what we do here. Um, I don't know, I believe, yes, the, the power of where religion is going, I hope, and also just the connected human dynamic. Like, as people in this society where there's millions of us, can we, can we realize that we're not alone? <laughs> like, I have to give so much credit to my congregation because they, they really do embrace. Yes. And, you know, just in the last year of becoming a mother, how much they have embraced that part of me yeah. and like held that and continued to hold me as their pastor yeah like it's been a huge blessing and i'm, so, I'm just really though. grateful yeah. yeah 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 i'm like i loved you guys before now i love you even more <laughs> like this is amazing and just so you know you guys you made it in our family group chat really oh, oh yeah wow. were, oh yeah we were all very so just know okay that. now i have to know what did you say what did you say <laughs> oh we got the announcement that oliver was here we were like yeah oh. <laughs> This is where it's like, yeah, we can try to act like these, these things are separate, but you matter so much to us, right? So it's, there is no yeah. way to, in a realistic way for us to be people with each other, to act as though somebody else's life doesn't matter to yours. Right. And I think there's like a dynamic, like when I am in a pastoral care conversation, like it's about helping the other person with their spiritual life. Yeah. So you're like, you were saying earlier, I might share a story, but it's very specific what story I'm sharing and why I'm sharing it and it's it's for the other person because that's that's my calling that's yeah. my job is to help the other person grow and I got friends and you know that helped me <laughs> yeah. and it's but it's like we're talking about it's it's not so like hard cookie cutter like this that and yeah. um, it's not I always think about like mad men I don't know if you ever saw that show, no, but I've heard of it. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's entertaining in its ways. It's also so beautifully obvious where the problems are. And I think the whole idea of it is that it doesn't even work for the main character who is glorified as the ideal. Um, but how in that show, it was so different to your work life and your life life and how detrimental that was for everybody within the system. Yeah. Not just, you know, not just the wife and kids at home, the, the wife of 2.5 kids in the white picket fence type vibe. It was, it was detrimental to, again, this is heteronormative, the father, but it was also detrimental to the people that he worked with and the fabric of their families with their, you know, siblings, their parents, their friends, like the idea that we're separating ourselves and only showing up in, in certain sections. And again, it's not that we're oversharing and, and uh, <laughs> I was thinking it's not, we're not flooding everybody with over information to then, you know, make it all about you. It's really how can, how is it okay for you to show up as the person you are and your experience to help inform and help while also absorb and learn from each other? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am, I'm so grateful that you joined today. I have always wanted to have a conversation about religion. And oftentimes I feel like, is blasphemous is the word sometimes. I'm like, I'm not allowed to say things. Um, and so I'm just so grateful for you coming here and letting me be like, hi, what about this thing? Uh, because I do feel like it's so incredibly powerful. Um, anybody that's in Connecticut at any time, uh, you should, if you're, if you're curious, you should for sure come join on a Sunday uh, at First Church in East Hartford. Um, are there any other things that you would like to share with the wonderful people that are listening right now? They could also um, come on Zoom with us, uh, churchcorners.org. We make it super, super easy. Uh, yes, that's what I do, my friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're there every Sunday via yeah. Zoom. So. Yeah. Yes, my father sends me a text message to remind me every Sunday. I'm like, hey, Dad, I'll be there. Yeah. Wake up call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm like, you know that I'm like, I wake up at like, seven, I don't need it, but thank you, Dad. He's like, I remember you used to sleep till noon. I was like, 
That was when I was, a, that was a teenager. That was 20 years ago, dad. 20 years ago. I've grown up. I'm an yeah. adult now. <laughs> a little bit. It's a little bit. Well, a little bit of adult. <laughs> Patrick, Kelly, Jane, thank you so much. Um, thank you. If anybody has any questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us and we will make sure we make connections where it's appropriate. I'm so excited that you came on today and um, I'll see you on Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me. Of course. Wonderful. I hope you enjoyed how many stories we talked about and talked through with Pastor Kelly Jane today. She's absolutely wonderful. Truly, if you are looking for a place of worship that is inclusive, I encourage you to go and join us for a virtual session if you are not based in Connecticut, or if you are and you want to give it a shot, definitely Sundays, great spot, great time to do so. Um, if you're interested in learning more about a racial justice ministry and maybe how uh, to make that happen in your church setting or your religious setting, don't hesitate to reach out. I'll do my best to try to connect you with the right people to get more of a framework of exactly how that came to be. As I mentioned in the episode, there is such a beautiful kind of organic nature to it. So a lot of that is willingness to ask questions of your community and see what they want and what would be helpful and be willing to try things, be willing to test things out and see what works. But if this is something that after this conversation, you're like, oh my goodness, I want to have one of those. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to connect with you. Um, my assumption is you're at the end of the episode, so you enjoyed it a little bit. If uh, you don't mind on your favorite podcasting platform, I know Apple and Spotify both have the opportunity for you to rate and review. We would love to hear from you of what you think about it. So feel free to um, to rate us over there and, and leave some sort of review for us to be able to understand what kind of information you really like and what you want to hear more of. So I will catch you on the next episode, my friends. <laughs>